right, so uh, we're starting off here, airspace. Uh, today is an airspace lecture. We'll start off with a quick introduction. Uh, my name's Sam. Uh, I am a, uh, I guess I'm the lead instructor here at Alts here, the only instructor, uh, but part of the team. Glad to be here, excited to be here. Uh, I work for an airline, and like I said, I'm on a ski week here with a bunch of airline pilots. And I was actually kind of quizzing them on like airspace questions. You know, it was just kind of funny for them to review it. Anyway, so uh, airspace classifications, we're talking about uh, airspace configurations, markings, uh, and then we have a little bit more than five questions. We're also going to go over the uh, special use airspace. So it's not an agenda, but we're going to go over that. Let's go ahead and talk about like controlled versus uncontrolled airspace. Uh, I'm going to treat this like you've already seen the video lecture series that Brandon's put out on the website. So this is really just like a quick little review. I'm going to go through everything. Uh, we have a uh, controlled and uncontrolled airspace. So uh, controlled airspace includes Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, Delta, and Echo. And the uncontrolled airspace is class golf airspace. Now, as a part 107, a uh, small unmanned system uh, drone operator, a remote piloting command, if you will, um, you're mostly going to be flying in class G uncontrolled airspace. Um, and this is good. Uh, as we'll see is that you don't need any sort of permission to go do what you want to go do, right? You want to go out and you want to go film this or you want to go get a sweet shot or do some survey work or whatever you're trying to do. Most of the time you can, uh, you can go do it without having to talk to anyone. Um, but here's the thing. Sometimes you do have to talk to people. You got to get air, air traffic control uh, permission, right? To operate there. So, um, you know, just this is really the most important part is distinguishing where these controlled areas are and where the uncontrolled areas are. Um, so let's start off here. We have this big old graphic here. It's actually put out by the FAA, and I love this graphic. It is, it is awesome. Um, so first of all, we have Class A airspace. A Class A, um, just think about it as like above. It's above you. It's above everywhere in the United States. Um, and it goes from 18,000 feet MSL up to flight level 600. Uh, 600 is technically, it's like around 60,000 feet. The reason why we say flight level instead of MSL, MSL is because we're using, when, when you get above 18,000 feet, you put your altimeter to 29 or 9 or 2, standard setting. So everyone up there is on the same altimeter setting. Uh, not important whatsoever. Just know that class A airspace, I think about above, A above. It's way above us, okay? Uh, so exclusively at high altitudes, 18,000 feet uh, of MSL and above. Um, so that's that. Uh, class B airspace. Uh, generally, I when I think of B, I think of big. A big, or this one says busy. So busy or big, right? Um, so airliners. Uh, most of your uh, big airports in the nation, such as Atlanta, uh, New York, or LaGuardia, JFK, uh, uh, Chicago, Midway, uh, Denver, um, all of these LA, yeah, all these air, these, uh, airports are going to be class Bravo airspace, um, big, big, big airplanes. Typically they go from the surface to 10,000 feet. So as you can see here in this graphic, it goes all the way from the surface to the 10,000 feet. And we call this the upside down wedding cake. So, um, what they do is they, they, they go to the surface in the middle and they go up and then they extend out a little bit more and then they go up and extend out a little bit more and go up. Uh, so think about why do we do that? Why, why is the national airspace system like that? Uh, really nobody cares. Uh, well, the, what, what, what the FAA cares about is safety of airline traffic, right? If you're paying $200 to go from Atlanta to Denver, right? Uh, you want to make sure that your, your airplane is not getting, not sucking up a drone, right? Coming in on landing. Uh, so what we do is, so they, they put this, this protected area around the airspace. Now, even though it goes from the surface here to, uh, I don't know, whatever the, the first ring is, uh, right here, if you can see my mouse, in this little area, you can fly underneath that shelf and you can fly underneath this shelf right here. Um, so you can fly underneath airspace, uh, but when it goes to the surface, it does go to the surface and then you have to uh, require the, the, the authorization from ATC. So be big busy, it goes from surface 10,000 feet, typically it's about 30 miles out uh, is how far the upper, the upper one will go. We'll, we'll, we'll look at some examples. Uh, Class Charlie airspace uh, generally goes from the surface to 4,000 feet MSL. Uh, and their surrounding airports that have an operational control tower. So these are like city airports. Uh, Class Charlie airports include uh, Indianapolis is Class Charlie, Lansing, Michigan, uh, Savannah, Georgia, there's a whole list of them, whole list of them. but they're, they're all big cities. Savannah is a big city. Indianapolis is the capital of Indiana, right? Lansing, capital of Michigan, all big cities. They just don't quite have the same traffic required to, uh, that, that, that would denote them a Class B status. Um, anyway, 
so, so that's classy airspace. Um, so I think of these as like city, city airports. Alrighty, so moving on here, um, class D airspace. Class D airspace is created for airports that have like an active control tower, but they may not see a lot of passenger airline traffic. So I'm from, uh, I went to school in the University of Michigan. Uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan is a class D airspace. Uh, let's see, Athens, Georgia, where the University of Georgia is, that's a class D airspace. Uh, and uh, they, ha they have active control towers, but um, not a lot of passenger airline traffic. So they typically go from the surface up to 2,500 feet and they go about four miles out. Uh, so those are just little, little things to remember. Um, so remember, if you're in Charlie, I'll go back to Charlie. So Charlie is surface to 4,000 and it goes uh, 10 miles out. And then Delta is surface to 2,500 feet and it goes uh, four miles out. Um, just small things to think about. And if we look down here on the, on the graphic, does it show? Mm, no, it doesn't, it doesn't quite show. But anyway, uh, so the point being is that if you're in Bravo, Charlie, or Delta, those are all airports. And as you can see in all three of these graphics, there is a cylinder that goes to the ground. So if you are going to operate your drone in these cylinders, uh, that is when you're going to need permission from ATC. Uh, so let's get to the fun stuff here. Now here's Class Echo. Class Echo is where it starts to get fun. Class Echo is technically controlled airspace, but there's nobody sitting there uh, really making sure and watching you what you do. Uh, class Echo airspace is typically from to get a pilot. So say you, you're on a, on a commercial flight, right? And you're flying from Class B airspace all the way to another Class B airspace airport, Atlanta to Denver, right? Well, until you get to Class A airspace because you're going above 18,000 feet. Like, for example, if you look at this graphic, you could fly right there and fly through this class E airspace though it's still controlled airspace uh but no one's keeping you from, from doing stuff um the reason why they call it control is just because it, it, it it's 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 really just a legality thing uh you know they're, they're calling it controlled airspace so if you do mess up it's because you were in control airspace but you don't need prior prior authorization uh to operate in uh you do, you do need prior authorization. Well, we'll talk, we'll talk about that a little bit with, with class E airspace. So for example, if, uh, if, uh, if an airport has class E airspace that extends to the ground. So sometimes on instrument on uh, sectional charts, you'll see class E airspace that goes to the ground. It's a dashed uh, magenta line. And on those, uh, you're gonna want to uh, call and tune into the frequency, but you don't have to call and actually receive physical permission. So that's the difference. But, but you need to be aware that you're operating class E airspace and that there's gonna be airplanes there. Uh, and then here's the fun stuff, class G airspace. Uh, so this kind of this kind of goes into Bob's question. We're going to talk about a little bit at the end here. But Clash G airspace, uh, I think of this as go, just go airspace. You can just go do whatever you want, right? So um, if you look here, it looks like the magenta on this on this page here is the Class G airspace. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of airports that that are just uncontrolled airports, and you can just go out there and you can go fly. Uh, where does Clash G airspace start? So class G airspace extends from the surface up to 1200 feet above the ground, okay? So if you look right here, so see where it says 1200 feet above the ground? Right there, that's where it is. Unless there's parts around an airport that have a, a, a magenta line and those magenta lined uh, areas per, will protect an airport, protect an airport with instrument approach procedures. So for example, uh, and, and, and that magenta line will have it go down to 700 feet. Uh, above the ground. Uh, the only two times that airspace will be marked as AGL or with class G airspace. Everything else is going to be MSL. Uh, so that's kind of a little, a little, a little uh, thing, a little star there. All right. Anyway, but so class G airspace, you don't need prior authorization and you can, uh, you can go fly anywhere, right? Uh, so why do you think uh, 700 feet AGL, right? If you go to, if it starts at 700 feet above the ground, how high can drones fly? How high can we fly our drones? We can fly 400 feet above the highest object. Um, and the reason why that is, is because 500 feet is the lowest altitude that airplanes can fly. So the FAA doesn't want drones and airplanes hitting each other, right? That just makes sense, right? Uh, and so that's why the Class G airspace, so it goes up to 700 feet AGL. We're keeping our drones at 400 feet. We don't have to worry about that, uh, which, which is nice, right? You can just go out there. You don't have to worry about the liability of hitting an airplane. Um, but ultimately it is still up to you to make sure that you're scanning the airspace and making sure uh, uh, you're being safe. All right, it looks like I have a question from, or Neil raised his hand. I don't, Neil, I can't see it. You just gotta throw, throw, a, uh, throw a message out here in the group and I can answer it. So uh, as you start to get the hang of reading sectional charts, it's important to understand how to identify different classes of airspace on a map. So uh, th there is a legend for 
airspace, uh, or sorry, for sectional charts and airspace on the charts. And this is the this is the um, uh, this, this is the legend. So we'll run through this real quick. On the controlled and reverse uh, reversed airspace effective below eighteen thousand feet. Yeah. So MSL are shown on this chart. All times are local. Exactly. So. Uh, every single altitude on the chart is MSL, except for Class G airspace, and that's AGO. And why? Because it's not shown on the map. Uh, in fact, you're just supposed to know that when you see this right here, it's Class E airspace with a floor of 700 feet above the surface, right? So it goes from the ground to 700 feet, and that means it's Class G until 700 feet. At 700 feet, it goes Class E airspace. Here's the Class E airspace that goes to the ground. I was talking about the dashed magenta line. Class D airspace has the, the dashed... Uh, dash blue line. So the way that I think about that is uh, the dashed line just means goes to the ground. That's the easiest way to think about it. Uh, and then the solid, the solid magenta line is class Charlie airspace. And then the solid blue line is going to be your class B airspace. Uh, this right here is, uh, for example, you'll see this in class C airspace and it'll be the ceiling. So how high the class C airspace goes. For example, this is going to be 4,000 feet. Um, if you ever get confused, uh, you know, it's not going to be 40 feet, you know, these little common sense, it's not going to be 40 feet, it's not going to be 400 feet, right, because 400 feet for an airplane is not very high. In fact, we can only fly our drones up to 400 feet, so it's going to be 4,000 feet. A ceiling value indicates a surface up to, but not including the value, actually, so it doesn't include 4,000 feet itself, kind of interesting. So uh, I hope I'm not going too fast. Uh, we'll kind of keep going through this. So here's an example of a class Bravo airspace. So this right here is the uh, Cleveland Airport. It's class Bravo airspace. And uh, you can see this inner ring here. This is kind of a more simple one. Cleveland's not a huge city, but it's big enough, obviously, to warrant class Bravo airspace. Uh, it goes from the surface to 8,000 feet here. I said typically it goes to 10, but that's not always true. Sometimes it does go to 8,000. So uh, surface to 8,000 feet within this here. So if you wanted to fly a drone within this area, you need to contact uh, flight service or contact ATC. Make sure you get permission. They will come after you, and they will know. Uh, in fact, we've, we've seen reports where uh, people are dri driving, uh, or sorry, are flying drones, and they'll they'll issue it out to pilots and be like, "Hey, make sure you're not like look out for this drone." It's pretty hard to see a drone when you're going 250 miles an hour or 200 200 knots. Um, so that's why they 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 were really strict about that. The last thing that you want you know do is get in trouble with the FAA. They'll come after you. They'll take your cert, and they may not take your drone. I don't know if they'll take your drone, but point being is that you're putting all this time and money into taking the exam into getting your certificate, into getting your nice drone and everything, getting this all up and running. Don't blow it. it follow the rules, right? So, okay. Let's let Nathan ask a question here. Other than part 107, what other search do you see that could prove favorable when uh, when looking for a drone pilot job? I heard of the Osho 10 question mark. Okay. Well, I'm going to answer that like at the end. That's like really unrelated, but I, I enjoy, I like how you're, uh, Thinking, thinking ahead. So cool. All right. Um, but I will get to that at the end. Um, so class Charlie airspace is, uh, is the solid magenta line. Uh, so this is an example of class Charlie airspace. Uh, here, this is the uh, uh, John Wayne County Airport, uh, it's Santa Ana, California. Um, so you can see here, uh, yeah, there's Newport Beach. Got a buddy from Newport Beach. So it goes from the surface up to 4,400 feet MSL. It does not include 4,400 feet MSL itself. So, uh, and I, I, I said earlier that typically class Charlie airspace goes from the surface up to 4,000 feet. Uh, in this example, it's 4,400 feet. So it's close. Um, also, Los Angeles is just extremely busy airspace. So you're not going to see the most picture perfect uh, version of class, class Charlie airspace, if that makes sense. Um, okay, so on the on the outer ring here, we have, uh, and then here you can see it goes from 1,500 feet to 5,400 feet. Here's 3,500 3, feet up to 5,400 feet. So the point being is that as a drone pilot, let's be practical here, you don't, you wouldn't have to, um, uh, you, you, these altitudes aren't super applicable to you because you're not going to be flying a drone at 1,500 feet, right? Uh, that being said, over here where it says 25 to 54, can you fly, a, can you fly a drone right here in this area? Absolutely. You want to go fly a drone at the Huntington Pier? You're 100% allowed to go do that because you're within 400 feet. You're not in any sort of controlled airspace. Now, if you want to fly a drone in this area right here by, say, a UCI, I don't know what UCI is, but say you're by UCI or a Mile Square Park and you want to fly a drone, you need to get permission and make sure that you do that. Oh, and it looks like Brandon came in and, 
and answer the question. Yeah, the Facebook groups are really good, a good place for those kind of questions. I mean, here's a class Delta airspace. So this is a Blake Lakefront regional. Actually, this is next to Cleveland. Yeah, there's Cleveland right there. I've flown into this airport. It's actually a really fun one because you have uh, uh, the, was it the Bengal Stadium right there? No, Cincinnati, uh, Cleveland. We have the Indians and you have the, um, oh man, this is bad. Cleveland Browns, Cleveland Browns. Yeah, there you go. So you have the Browns and the, uh, the Indians are right there. Um, but, but also you have the hard rock or the, uh, rock and roll hall of fames right there. It's a really cool area. So if you ever want to fly in, it's kind of a, it's kind of a more bougier airport. Um, but I flew in there one time and just went the day and took a, took a cab to, to the, actually they have crew cars. So pilots, uh, they have free cars for you to take and go into town. Not important whatsoever. Anyway. So uh, this is class Delta airspace. So here it goes from the ground, right? And it goes up to 3000 feet. Does it include 3000 feet? No. Um, so if you want to fly a drone in Cleveland, uh, you're going to make sure you get that permission. It might be kind of, might be kind of difficult. We'll see. And I, I, I actually don't know how easy they are. Um, yeah. And the cast for the NBA. Yeah. You're right. You're right. Pete. Um, yeah. I, I don't know how hard they are. If they if they say yes or no kind of thing. Um, if, or if they'll always say yes or no, but who knows, it's worth a shot. It's going to be a no unless, and it's always going to be a no until you ask. Right. So if you ask, at least you got a shot. Uh, and I'm sure I'm sure they're pretty accepting. Okay, so here's class E airspace, and here's an example of the class E airspace that goes to the floor. Um, technically, if actually I'll go back a little bit. Look at this. All the airspace in between airspace. This is all class E airspace. Okay. The only depiction on the chart is where it goes to the ground. So this here is Big Bear City. I'm not sure where this is. Uh, this looks like it's out west somewhere. Uh, Big Bear Lake. Uh, that's cool. Anyway. Uh, wow, the airport's at 6,700 feet elevation. Uh, so that's pretty high. Um, anyway, so that's Big Bear. So here it's saying that this right here, this line, the class echo airspace, because it's everywhere, E, E everywhere. I don't know if I said that earlier, but E stands for everywhere. It's everywhere. Uh, the E airspace goes down to 700 feet. In this circle right here, 700 feet. Outside of the circle, outside of the circle, the class E airspace goes up to 1200 feet, right? So they just do that to protect the airport, give it a little bit more controlled airspace closer to the ground. Um, but that being said, can you fly a drone in Big Bear City or in the surrounding area and have to contact anyone? No, not at all. You can you can go out there and you can fly your drone and have a good time uh, as long as you're within 400 feet and you're following the rest of your regulations. So cool. All righty. And uh, now we're going to talk about a special use airspace. So all special use airspace will have their own distinct markings. Uh, this includes prohibited, restricted, warning, military, oper uh, military operating areas. Um, in addition to that, each special use airspace can be identified with a code. So I have this little like uh, nifty acronym. I call it MICPRON. We call it the uh, the Scottish Irish, or sorry, the was it the Scottish Fighting Shrimp, MICPRON. Anyway, so uh, the, the it's a nice little acronym. And so uh, you have MOAs, controlled firing, prohibited, restricted, alert, warning, and national defense. We're going to go through all those. Here we go. We got a question here from Iraq. What up, Iraq? If you're flying your drone in a Class G airspace and you're about to enter any other airspace, does the drone alert you or stop you, or are you just supposed to calculate where you are in the map? So part about being a pilot is being a pilot, right? I mean, I know that you guys aren't. Uh, yeah, you know, it's a different kind of pilot, right? It's it's more the modern age pilot, right? Um, but really, the responsibility is on you. You are the remote pilot in command. Um, that, I mean, it's, it's a big deal, right? You are liable for your drone. So anytime before I go on a flight, right? We have a flight plan. We're calculating where we're going to fly, what the weather is like. We're checking the weather. We're checking NOTAMs. We're checking for air, uh, airspace. We're checking for uh, TFRs and stuff, which we'll talk about here in a moment. But if you get a gust of wind and for some reason, like if you're operating right there on the edge and you're technically legal, but then you get a gust of wind and it blows into that airspace, yeah, you bet your butt you're, uh, you are liable for, for, for infringing that airspace. Um, and you most 100% will get a call from the FAA. Uh, the way that I play it is I play it safe, right? Play it 100% safe, uh, better safe than sorry. So if you're operating near any kind of stuff, even if, it, you're, if you know you technically legally don't have to contact ATC, uh, just, just, you know, uh, give them a call, you know, uh, give them a call and be like, hey, like, I'm working over here, like, you know, just... Uh, uh, just make sure. Uh, I'm working in the area. Uh, just want to get late, give you guys a heads up. I don't think I should be entering the airspace, but if I do, just know it's over here. And just and so, so you're in communication, right? They don't want to just see something pop up and you're they're like, oh, what's going on? 
they, and they're freaking out, right? Um, so as long as you keep everyone in the loop and be safe and be a competent pilot, then you'll be fine. Just plan, you know. Uh, Georeferencing is probably a part of some drones, uh, but I don't know if I, I, <laughs> I don't know if I put, I put my license on it. Um, yeah, it says most drones have it. So yeah, I don't, I don't know. I mean, yeah, that one's up to you. Shouldn't we use the before you fly app? Uh, I don't know what app you can use. Yeah, you can use it before you fly. Uh, I, I use different stuff, or you can look at it. You can look at a, like an actual chart too. So uh, we got resources on the website. So, all right, I'm going to keep going through this, hammering it out. Uh, MOAs are military operating areas. Uh, they're just areas where uh, military aircraft are operating. Uh, it, they, they operate in those areas. Uh, there is activity of military aircraft and it can be potentially uh, dangerous. Um, the, every single one's unique. They're going to have their own limits and boundaries. Uh, and you have to check on those on the margin of the sectional. So the sectional has margins. You can also just pretty much Google anything these days. You can Google Hershey MOA, like times it's active and the altitudes. If it goes all the way to the ground, then um, then you need to obviously that, that attain, like it's very pertinent information to you as a pilot who's gonna be flying within 400 feet of the ground. But it, some of these, these some of these MOAs go up to like 18,000 feet and they start at 5,000 feet. So, you know, it, it doesn't mean anything to you. So just, just make sure you're checking that and uh, getting that going. Okay, so I've got another question here. Man, I, I love the interaction, guys. Keep them coming. You don't have to, you don't have to be sorry for anybody, anything. Uh, I thought only the class E airspace that extends to the ground is marked by the dashed magenta lines. That is correct. That is correct. Dashed magenta goes to the ground. This is not the dashed magenta. This is a MOA like hatch mark. Um, so this right here, this is the shaded magenta. Um, shaded magenta goes down to 700 feet. Uh, let's see if I have a picture. <laughs> oh man, it's the altitude, I guess, or something. Uh, so I'll, I'll pull up an example of, I think, I think we have an example of oh, this right here. It doesn't go to the ground. It goes to 700 feet. This is 700 feet above the ground. So below that 700 feet is class G airspace. So class G airspace is 700 feet. And then at 700 feet, you have class E airspace. All good, man. All good. Shade of magenta. Yep. Shade of magenta, 700 feet. All right. We're going to knock through these prohibited airspace. Guess what? Prohibited. You can't fly in prohibited airspace. Uh, as the name would suggest, it's prohibited. Uh, you'll see prohibited airspace around Washington, D.C. You'll see a lot of prohibited airspace out in the Nevada desert. Mm, what area is in the Nevada desert that you can't fly over because they don't want you seeing what's out there? Area 51, aliens. I don't know, but uh, you can't, you can't, there's a lot of prohibited airspace out there. Uh, there's also restricted airspace. <clears throat> so actually, I should go back. MOA literally says MOA, M-O-A, military operating area. Uh, the restricted or sorry, prohibited says P P 40 Papa 40. This, so this one's Papa 40, but they'll just, they'll just have a Papa. Um, let's see what's next year. Uh, restricted airspace. So you have R uh, five, five, zero, two Bravo and Alpha and Bravo. This is actually by Port Clinton in, uh, Northern Ohio, uh, Michigan, Detroit's like right over here. And then Ann Arbor's over there. So I would, I would fly there. There's a great airport restaurant here at the Erie Ottawa national airport. And there's a bunch of little fun airports here. Putin Bay is really cool. But anyway, there's this restricted area right here. And uh, it goes from like 4,000 feet up to like 18,000 feet or something. So it, it wouldn't affect a, uh, a drone pilot, but, but it would 100% affect aircraft. Uh, sometimes, sometimes they do go down to the surface, you know, so that's why you got to be vigilant. And you have to check, right? Um, so that's restricted airspace. Uh, can you fly in restricted airspace? Not while it's active. There are, there are times when it goes inactive. So prohibited, absolutely not, never. MOAs, there's like active and inactive. You can fly into MOA when it's active, but like you shouldn't because you need to be exercising extreme caution. Uh, and then restricted airspace, uh, you can, you cannot operate in them when they are active. So just make sure you check and you can get a, your briefer will tell you when you get a briefing on the phone, they'll tell you the airspace is, is active. If you're ever flying near this kind of stuff, you know, like, like I said, Play it safe, you know, play it safe. Make sure that you're uh, you're being smart and call it if you're even going to work near it, remotely near it, you know. Um, okay, next one, alert. Uh, alert airspace, this is actually down in Florida. So uh, uh, Embry-Riddle is an aviation university and they're right there in Daytona Beach. This is west of Daytona Beach. The reason why it says uh, alert area, uh, it's, it's defined by an A. It's just saying that be careful because there's other airplanes out there flying there's a, there's a lot i mean this one literally says high volume of flight training surface to 4000 feet that's because all the embry rail kids go out there to go uh practice their maneuvers so a lot of airplanes out there you can absolutely operate a drone in the alert airspace you just need to be vigilant uh and then you have warning airspace so um warnings typically seen like off the coast 
uh, you need to check once again with briefers and make sure that, you know, if, if you are going to operate out there, uh, talk to someone, you know, make sure that a, that you're not in it. If you are in it, like you can always ask, you can always ask to operate, uh, and they just may say no. So, you know, uh, but always, always ask first. Uh, and then they have the continuous U S uh, EDIZ stands for, uh, air defense or air defense international zone or something like that. Oh, no, no, no. Air, air identification zone or something like that. Anyway, it goes around the entire U S and pretty much it just keeps smugglers or, uh, uh it, it's a constant surveillance to make sure that people aren't entering our borders from, from the air. Um, so those are all the airspaces. Uh, as you notice, I said controlled firing earlier, uh, controlled firing airspace is a thing, but it's not charted on charts because, uh, whenever the military, it's, it's, you know, they're, they're, they're practicing shooting live ammunition and rounds, but whenever they see someone coming nearby, they cease their operation. So there's no need to put it on a chart because the military is on top of that and they take care of that. Uh, so that's McBron, M-C-P-R-A-W-N. Um, and then coming up here, we have the, oh yeah, and National Defense Airspace. So that's the, the eight is. Air Defense Identification Zone. That's what it stands for. Anyway, last but not least, let me pull jobs here. Last but not least, we have uh, the temporary flight restrictions. What is a TFR? Uh, TFRs are tools used by the uh, FAA to restrict aircraft operations within designated areas, times and areas really is what I should say. It's not depicted on charts. And guess what? This is a great way to lose your certificate or your license. Uh, VIP, professional sports, college sports, and Disney World all have TFRs. Uh, so anytime there is a major sports event, uh, for example, MLB, there's a baseball game. If you wanna fly there, they have uh, a TFR up and you can't fly while the TFR is active. Uh, Trump Tower in New York actually had a TFR on it while he was president because obviously he would live there. They don't want planes flying in that TFR. Uh, what else? Uh, it's kind of funny though. It's like some professional sports have it, but some professional sports don't. Like I don't think the where the WNBA has a has a has a has a TFR. I don't I don't know. So I guess or like I don't think MLS Major League Soccer has TFRs either. And they're just like they're just like. Mm. Like, I don't think you deserve one. Okay. We're running a little bit late on time, but we're almost done here. Uh, so yeah, professional sports, college sports. So we got some stuff here. Would the Super Bowl have a TFR? Yeah, you bet you're about the Super Bowl has a TFR. Yeah, 100%. Uh, NFL is like one of the biggest like revenue generating conglomerates there is. So uh, they for sure have a no drone flying there. Um, you can you can check the TFRs online. So there's a website for that. Um, no, I can show you how to do that. Okay. So here we're going to start going through the questions. There's a little bit more than five questions. I'm going to kind of hammer through these, but I'm going to grab a water real quick because my throat is very dry. Go ahead and try and answer this one and uh, I'll be right back. Ooh, also real quick, um, let's go ahead and pull out your testing supplement. Pull out your testing supplement because a lot of these questions are going to be relying on that. So uh, I'll be right back in just a moment. Uh, question number seven, the outer uh, rings of Class Charlie airspace are typically A, five miles from the airport, B, 10 miles from the airport, or C, 20 miles from the airport. Um, doo -doo -doo. So the answer is B, 10 miles from the airport. So I hope everyone got that right. And I would like to see everyone put their responses here in the, uh, in the chat. Um, so on the next question, folks, throw in your responses, and I appreciate it. All right, next question. The floor of the Class Bravo airspace at the Dallas Executive Airport is uh, A, at the surface, B, 3,000 feet, or C, 3,100 feet MSL. Hmm. Okay, so spot three. Uh, oh, my goodness, it's tiny. So here, I should have really had the testing supplement out. Um, spot three, right here. And then Dallas Executive, uh, Romeo Bravo Delta. Uh, so the floor of the Class Bravo airspace, or Class Bravo, goes up above this, right? So we can see that uh, here there is a 30 over a 110, or 110 over a 30. So we don't think that's 110 feet, right? And that doesn't make sense. So it's actually 11,000 feet over 3,000 feet. And if you actually look here to the side, you'll see a little 30 here in the box. And what that's saying is that uh, the, the top of the class Delta airspace goes up to 3,000. And we, we know that it doesn't include technically include 3,000 because at 3,000 feet, you have Class Bravo airspace that starts at 3,000 feet and it goes up to 11,000 feet. So the answer is B, Bravo. Neil, Monty, thank you guys so much. I appreciate it. Y'all got it. 3,000 feet. Yeah, Pete, if you want to like throw it in the actual chat, 
instead of the uh, the Q and A answer part, that'd be uh, that'd be cool. Uh, what is the floor of the Class Bravo airspace at Fort Worth Alliance Airport? It's Area Four. So actually, I put in Area Four right here. I think I blew this one up a little bit so I could see it. Uh, Fort Worth Alliance. So that's Alpha Fox Shot Whiskey. Alpha Fox Shot Whiskey is right here. Okay. And what is the floor of the Class Bravo airspace? Anyone? We have about thirty seconds here. Anyone? Bueller, Bueller, Bueller. Robert, Bob says. Hey, Pete says at the surface, let's see. So the floor of the class Bravo airspace at the Fort Lance. Well, we know that the class Bravo airspace doesn't go to the floor. Why? Because we know that this right here, this dashed blue line going around the airport, we know that's a class D airspace, right? So the, the floor of the class Bravo airspace isn't going to be right there because we know this is a class D airport, right? So once again, just like on the previous question, this area here, uh, let's see if we can find the numbers. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. Well, here we have the 3,000. The 3,000 comes right here. It gets cut off right there. Are there numbers somewhere else that we can find in here? Hmm. I don't know. This is a bad screenshot. Hmm. Oh, well, actually, actually, well, no, we can say that right here. The, the, the class Bravo airspace goes through the class Delta airspace right here. And you see the little 30 right here, which means this goes up to 3,000 feet. And at 3,000 feet, what begins? The class Bravo airspace right there. So just like the, uh, the previous example, the class Bravo airspace at AFW goes to B, 3,000 feet. Boom, 3,000 feet. So uh, nice job, Advil, Advil. Nice job, Advil. And uh, better luck next time, folks. So um, all good. That's why we're here. That's why we're here to learn. And this is being recorded. So you can always go back and quiz yourself again and make sure why, why you got it right or wrong. All righty, here's another question here. So let's see what we got. According to 14 CFR Part 107, the Remote Pilot in Command, the RPIC, I should say RPIC, uh, of a small unmanned aircraft planning to operate within Class Charlie airspace, must A, use a visual observer, B, required to use a flight plan, or C, required to receive ATC authorization. What are we thinking, folks? Everyone's saying C. Yeah, this one's kind of gimme. Boom, required to receive ATC authorization. You're gonna, I bet, I bet dollars or dimes you're gonna see a question like that on your exam. You, you know, there at least if one question is gonna say airspace and and uh, authorization. Cause I mean, that's one of the big things about, about, about the certificate. All right, question number 99, area three. What is the floor of the, of the Savannah Charlie airspace uh, on the shelf of the outer ring? Let's see what we got here. So the outer ring, right? So we have the inner ring here. The inner ring goes from these FSCs so that surface to 4,100 feet. Um, that's the inner ring. On the outer ring, it goes from 13 to 41. What does that mean? It's going to be 13 is going to be what? It's going to be 13,000. No, that doesn't make sense. It's going to be 1,300 feet, right? So 1,300 feet. Now, the question is, is it AGL or MSL? Hmm. Okay, let's see what's, what we're seeing. Okay, Monty saying B, Neil saying B, Abel saying B, Pete saying MSL, B, Bob saying B. Correct, folks. The answer is B. Good job. All right. No, next one. Good job, Dwayne. Nice. All right, top five questions here. Another one. Question number 100, according to 14 CFR, part 107. How may a remote pilot in command, this one just says remote PIC, uh, operate an unmanned aircraft in class Charlie airspace? Hey, wait a minute. This seems like the same question. Hmm. Hmm. Remote pilot must monitor ATC frequency from launch to recovery. Hmm. That's not bad. Remote pilot must have the prior authorization from ATC having uh, jurisdiction over that airspace. Hmm. And C, the, rem the remote pilot must contact air traffic control after launching the unmanned aircraft. Well, I don't know. C's pretty close. What's everyone saying? Everyone's saying B. Yeah, congratulations, guys. It is B. Uh, I promise you, you're going to see a question like that. So if you think this is easy, good. That's awesome. It means you're getting it. All right. What is normally the vertical limit of Class Charlie airspace directly overlying the airport? Is it A, 1,000 feet MSL, B, 3,000 feet MSL, or C, 4,000 feet MSL? What do we got? What do we got? Monty says C. Uh, let's see. Logan says C. Everyone's saying C. And folks, I think the folks who said C, this is the answer C, is in fact correct. Which is true concerning the blue and magenta colors used to depict airports on sectional aeronautical charts? A, airports with control tires underlying Class B, C, D, and E airspace are shown in blue. Airports with control towers uh, underlying class C, D, and E air, airspace are shown in magenta. Or C, airports with control towers underlying A, B, C, airspace are shown in blue, D, and E are shown in magenta. What are we thinking, folks? What are we thinking? What are we thinking? What do we got? 
Come on, folks. Let's get a couple answers here. Even if you're guess, even if you're wrong, guess. Come on, give me a guess. Okay, I have more than one response. Man, you like the easy ones. The easy ones, everyone throws an answer out. Well, we know here. So I'll, I'll, I'll help you out here. Okay. So uh, airports with control towers, the first part of the question is all the same, right? Unrelying, and then it says the, all the different ones. Uh, a, B, and C, airspace are shown in blue, D, and E are shown in magenta. So here's the thing, it says with control towers, so you know that if there's a control tower, it's not going to be class E airspace, because class E airspace doesn't have a control tower. So we know that B and C uh, are always oh, airports with control towers, underlying uh, E airspace shown in blue. Well, that's interesting, actually. Um, I would say uh, the answer is A, B, C, D, and E are shown in blue. So, I mean, I guess you could say A because it's underlying the airspace, right? I mean, A airspace is everywhere, so you could say it's C. Hmm. But maybe you're just also overthinking that one. Or shown in blue, D and E are shown in magenta. I know that if, I know that D is not in magenta. Yeah, airports with control tires underlying B, C, D, and E airspace are shown in blue. I think it's A. Let's go for that. Oh, nice. So it's A. The reason why it's A, uh, control towers underlying B, C, D, and E airspace uh, are shown in blue. Control towers are always blue, right? Remember, Class E airports where they where there is no control tower. So it says with a control tower. And I think what they're getting at here, I know that seems like tricky. Like, why would a, a Class E airspace have a control tower? Technically, if a Class D airspace uh, airport has a control tower and it closes, then usually it reverts to either Class G airspace or Class E airspace. So it's a little tricky on that one. Uh, and that was a little bit of a tougher question. But um, let's see who got it. Monty got it. Good job, Monty. So um, it's a little tricky there, folks. All right. That's what we got. And that's the end of that. Um, so let's see how we're doing on time. How's my battery doing? Ooh, 8% battery. Uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be here for questions. Uh, Bob had a question on the exam. So let me go pull up the uh, exam real quick. Oh, I'll show you two things here. Let me show you. Before I show you that, I'll show you TFRs. So let me get rid of this water before I spill it on myself. Um, TFR, TFRs.fa.gov. Uh, there's a thing called here tfr.fa.gov. I can put it in here. tfr.fa. Yeah, .gov. So it takes you to this page right here, and this will be all all the TFA shown in the um uh in the uh in, in the United States here. So if you go to map, map's the easiest way to do it, and then you'll see a list of TFRs. Where's the Super Bowl being held? I don't I don't know this for some reason. Um, anyone? Where's the Super Bowl being held? They probably have a TFR. Oh, oh, it's in LA. Yeah, look at that. So there's a huge one over LA. Let's go look at it. So I think if you just click on it, it'll like keep zooming in for you. There's LA. So nice. Um, so I know it's kind of hard to read here, but you'll see like look at here, date to uh two A. What day is the Super Bowl? I know it's next Sunday, but um, I don't know what day of the week that is. Uh the 13th. Thanks, Nathan. Yeah, so the 13th. Um Los Angeles, California, Sunday, 13th. There you go, right there. So it says uh, type security, a uh, facility, Zulu Lima Alpha. So it's uh, the uh, LA. And it says there is a description. So if you click on that, uh, it'll show you right here. So here's the TFR in relation to Los Angeles Airport, in relation to uh, all these different airports and stuff. And then there's usually a, a description. So it says effect area, uh, let's see, on Vortac at the radial four miles, it's a one mile ring up to, up to and including 3,000 feet. Uh, it's effective. So here's what you really need to know if you want to fly there. Uh, from effective on the 13th day at 1800 uh, Zulu time. So the Zulu conversion is five, six, seven, eight. So eight. So 18 minus eight is going to be from 10 a.m. to, uh, let's see, uh, we have the 20, 22. So 22 minus eight is, uh, was that 1430? Uh, that can't be right. Oh yeah, it says well, it says fourteen thirty Pacific Standard Time. Oh, it's, it's in the middle of the day. It's not at night. Oh, because it's West Coast, right? So the East Coast would be at night. Mm, that makes sense. Uh, so yeah, so from ten a.m. to two thirty local time, and I did I didn't even see the little fit that they give you the conversion here. Uh, that you can't you can't go flying during that time, right? Because you will, and they will. Here's a whole reasons why you can't do it. What you kind of can't do. So. Uh, that's kind of fun, kind of interesting, right? You get to like kind of see like how this applies in the real world. Uh, last but not least, I'm going to pull up this question uh, that Bob had. The floor of the classic airspace over the town of Silviana is. So this one's been given uh, people. Thanks for the app. That application helps sol solidify the info. Yeah, for sure, man. Absolutely. It's good to see like real world stuff. Uh, so over Sil Silviana. Um, so let's see, area four. Here's area four. Here's Silviana. I had someone ask this question in the uh, 
in the Facebook group. Also, here's the thing, folks, as more and more people take the uh, are, are joining the group, if you ever have a question, just kind of like search the Facebook group and see if someone's already asked that question. Because uh, I remember I've already answered this question, which is fine. I don't mind answering it again. That's the whole point of this live Q&A, but just for future tips. So Silviana, right? So half the town, if you look here, so yellow, the yellow, yellow means it's a populated area. It means it's a town. So the yellow portion of the town is cut in half. There is a ring right here, okay? And you may be like, okay, where does the classic year space start on the ring? It's the hard border, the hard outer border. So for example, the town here on this side of the, the shaded magenta is gonna be 1200 feet AGL because we know that this shaded area, the class E airspace goes down to 700 feet AGL. So the town has both 1200 feet AGL and 700 feet AGL. If you come here, I'm sorry folks, the floor of the class E airspace or the town of Silviana is both 700 feet and 1200 feet AGL. Class E airspace, goes down to 700 feet inside of that and then 1200 feet outside of that. So it's both technically. So kind of fun, right? Hope that answers that, uh, Bob. Did you, uh, is that clear it up? Or if you have a follow-up question, go ahead and uh, throw, throw it out there. Um, but that's pretty much the lecture. Thank you all for coming. we got a nice, decent kind of size crowd. we got 17 people here. So I mean, myself included, I think Brandon's here as well. So 15 people, that's, that's nice. Yep, absolutely, Bob. There you go. Neil, man, always a pleasure. When when's your exam, Neil, man? You've been you've been coming to these for a while. Logan, yeah, absolutely. Thank you guys. Thank you guys. Wouldn't do it without. Wouldn't be here without you guys. So, if you enjoyed this video and you want to learn more about unlocking your drone's full potential and becoming a confident drone pilot, then be sure to check out our course, 14 Day Drone Pilot Pro. It's a speed learning program for beginners, teaching aerial photography and video editing, and our students are absolutely loving it. I'll link it in the description below. Make sure to click that subscribe button and we'll see you in the next video.